Hello, everyone. First of all, I want to give the compliments to the Reagent team because I think that's a great gesture to open up the conference to everyone uh, in these times. Uh, now everyone can sit at home and watch the conference, which I think is really cool. Uh, I, for one, can't wait for this uh, pandemic to be open over because, well, as you can see by my hair, it's starting to get really frustrating, especially if it's like this in front of my eyes. Yeah, I, I can't wait to go to the barber again. Anyway, let's get to the talk. My name is uh, Ives van Horen. Uh, this one name is quite hard to pronounce, also in the Netherlands, so you can call it Eves, Ives, Eve, Ive. My friends also have trouble with pronouncing my name, so they call me Flip. If you want to call me Flip, that's fine as well. Um, I'm the co-founder of Code Sandbox. That's an online uh, code editor. Um, however, I'm not here to talk about Code Sandbox specifically. I want to talk about bundlers because we've been talking a lot about bundlers before, but almost always in the context of generating a very efficient bundle for the user. And I want to talk about bundlers in the context of development, because I think that bundlers can be much faster than they are today. Um, and especially since we have some really interesting new tools like React Fast Refresh, we should really take a hard look at how we can improve the bundle time of bundlers and look at the tools, the bundlers that already are fast. So today I want to talk about demystifying development bundlers. So first of all, let me paint the picture of something that I'm trying to solve. When you have the average uh, bundler, average project, you normally have have, from what I've seen, a compilation time of 40 seconds and then a recompilation time of around two seconds. So when you save, it takes two seconds to uh, make that change. And I think this is already pretty conservative. Uh, I wish I could see a show of hands of people who have seen worse experiences, but not possible right now. We can talk about it after. However, uh, I want to talk about the recompilation time because recompilation time is not only two seconds, there is much more involved. If you press, when you press save, you normally have to wait two seconds, then the browser refreshes, and you have then to reproduce the state. So if you take, for example, if you're tweaking a margin or if you're changing a color, every time you have to go through the process of doing the recompilation, waiting two seconds, refreshing, opening the modal again, which you're editing or input form, and continuing, which is a super frustrating process. And I think we can improve on this. There was even a, bun, uh, a project I've seen where they had recompilation time of 12 seconds. Well, those people can probably get a coffee every time they press recompile. So this is something that we can improve. Um, because we have recompilation time of two seconds, we resort to the dev tools because that's fast. Once you make a change in the dev tools, you can immediately see the result. And this is a beautiful tool for this. It's really cool to see that you can uh, see what the effect is of changing styles. And this is what I see myself doing as well. We have a recompilation time of two seconds and I go to the dev tools very often to make my changes and then I put them back into the code. However, this is not perfect. Uh, as seen from this tweet, you tweak the styles in dev tools until everything is just perfect and then move back into code and apply the changes with around 50% recall accuracy. I noticed this myself um, as well. And the problem with dev tools, changing dev tools and then getting it back in the code editor is that one, the dev tools are not a one on one mapping with the code. For example, if you use styles components or style JSX, for example, you are not able to copy over everything perfectly. Uh, you cannot use your design tokens, you cannot use your existing styling, and it only works for styles. It doesn't work for state. So it's really a one off thing. So we should do something about this average process. And initially, I thought this was the norm for me. However, um, at some point, a couple of years ago, we were working on a design system, and I was looking into um, I was looking into getting my design system into documentation. And that's when I saw React Style Guide. Is apparently it's Latin. Um, I don't think React is Latin. Anyway, the thing that surprised me a lot was that. The code was editable. Once, if I was changing code, like poc, 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 it immediately updated within the actual uh, column, which was super surprising to me. And I think that's really cool. And I never thought it would be this fast. It feels like it's instantly reflected into the code. Can even change the styling, really break the full layout. 
Um, and you might say, well, Eve's Eve, Eve, or Eve of Flip. This is just a single component. This is, this is, of course, it's fast because we're only changing a single component. And that's what I thought as well initially. Um, but I decided to start playing a bit more. Um, and this, this, exactly this, gave me the idea of building uh, Code Sandbox uh, with an in browser bundler so it could be very fast. So let me show a bigger project. It's this frame or motion reorder animation. This is already a bit bigger. You have dependencies. Um, and the cool thing is that I can also change damping here, for example, and it immediately updates. Or I can change the stiffness here and it immediately updates. How beautiful. And then you might say, well, Eve's Eve, Eve, or Flip, this is also a small project. So now I want to get some bigger guns out. I want to show Excalibur uh, running in code sandbox. And I think everyone here knows Excalibur. Uh, it's an amazing tool that allows you to create these wireframes. Uh, I use it every day. It's, it's, I love it. Anyway, I want to show you a small development process. So let's say I am working on this color picker here. And this color picker, um, if you have normal flow, for example, I wanted to change the background color, for example. Um, with the normal flow, I would have to make a change, wait two seconds, wait for this to refresh, open this thing again, and make my next change. Repeat, 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 which is, this, this, this is just not perfect. Um, so I want to show how it works, how it would look like in both So let's first make the background red. So, um, this is, oh, maybe I should, uh, well, anyway, I think I should, yeah. So this is when the background is red, but now the cool thing here is that I can change color. You can immediately see the changes. You can play with the result and the code changes here, which means that really you're not working in a dev tool, you're working in your real code and you can see the changes instantly. And this is, well, I think the pink is a beautiful color. Sorry if I go too close to the camera. So this is the kind of flow that we're going for. We'd like to have everything rendered instantly. Now I think, well, this is now a beautiful color picker. I want to maybe increase the padding too. So maybe something like this, or maybe a bit bigger. Yeah, now, now it's clear that this color picker is open. So maybe we should also increase the gap a bit. Uh, we're slowly getting there, I think. Oh, this is interesting. slowly getting to the point that uh, that this color picker looks beautiful. Um, so this is only for styles, but it also happens to work for, for example, with states. So do you see these really small numbers in here? You could change them instantly as well without having to reopen the picker and having to wait for the compilation to happen. So let me just search where it is. Uh, it's here, I think. Do I have the right file open? Oh yeah, here it is. So I can, for example, put an A after it. And there you have it. You have one A and the E. And I could even do POC. And there we have another POC. Um, so this is really something that's possible. Um, and once you get to think of it, you kind of want to get from this process to only a recompilation time of 50 milliseconds. This is the goal, because then you can do much more recompilation. And once you are in this process, you don't want to go back. Um, Evan Yu has been experimenting with this as well, and I will get back to this later, but he has a tweet that kind of gets it, um, in my opinion. He says, how do people put up with full page reloads when tweaking CSS or component templates in a decently sized app? My guess is that they haven't tried something with uh, lower than 50 milliseconds HMR before. And I completely agree. Once you get used to this kind of way of development, you never want to go back. And I think we should make it a norm because results will be more polished if you are able to really fast change things and see the result, then you will be inclined to try more. That's, that's human nature. You will be inclined to try uh, more results and you will have a more polished version. You might say, I want to test this animation just in this way as well. Another one is that it will allow for more experimentation. Um, 
for example, you will you can try another function, or you can say maybe we should make this for loop iterate 200 times instead of 100 times. So that is one of the um, advantages. And the next thing is that it allows for more learning. So if uh, I don't know about you, but if I'm not familiar with the code base, the first thing I'm going to do is put an alert somewhere and see if the code is run. If people are getting familiar with the code base, it's so much nicer if they can make changes to the code and immediately see the result instead of having to wait. Um, it's really useful for people learning the code base. So if you improve the recompilation time, you increase productivity, but if you remove the recompilation time altogether, you introduce a new style of development that will result in more polished results, um, but also uh, a code base that's easier to learn. So let's uh, make instant recompilation to norm. But before we can get there, we need to know how bundlers actually work. So now I'm going to explain how a bundler works in a nutshell. And then I will talk about work that has been done around uh, in the space of bundlers to make instant recompilation happen. And I will highlight how they work. So what do current bundlers do? I have to say. Bundlers are really, really advanced. Um, bundlers resolve, transform, concatenate, hop reload, minify, optimize. They do all these things. However, most of the complicated logic is into the last two options. It's the minifying and optimizing. The, the fact that bundlers have to do tree shaking, that they have to do bundle splitting, that they have to do optimized chunking. That is really complicated logic. But if you look at a development bundler, a bundler that's purely focused on giving a good developer experience, you actually don't have to do those things. And it suddenly, suddenly simplifies the process. So I want to talk about how a dev bundle works. So let's take these three steps, resolve, transform, concatenate. Let's say I have this index.js that imports um, a string from a.js and I console log it. The first thing that happens is that we resolve the file. So we resolve a.js, we find out it just doesn't export default hello world, such so original, and we continue. The next step that we need to do is transforming. We need to make this code understandable by the browser and uh, make it uh, so that the browser can run it so that we can concatenate it into one bundle. So the bundle is converted to common.js or any other kind of transformer is put on top of it. So in our case, it's Babel. Babel uh, can do this uh, pretty fast uh, between 50 and 200 milliseconds. So we replace the contents with the transformed file. Next step, we wrap the code into a function that exposes require, module, and exports because those are the expected, those are the expected uh, globals that are available in the file. So you can see that uh, the top version, they call require from the function. And in this part, they set the exports.default. So we have this code. The last step that we need to do is we need to map every file to a module number. This is more of an optimization, but it's really important and useful. So we say that index.js is zero, a.js is one and we replace the require statement of a.js to one. So we say, instead of requiring a.js, uh, we say require one so that we don't have to do all this resolving logic anymore. Uh, it's just a simple uh, number. Final step is the concatenation process. So this is a lot of code. Well, a lot of code, it's, I don't know, 16 lines. But what's really important to see is that we create a module map with the ID, the module ID, and then we just put the function after the module ID. So you, this is the bundle, essentially. The module map is the bundle. And then we have some helper functions. Uh, we have one helper function, which is the require function. And the require function is responsible for taking an ID, executing the goat with the right global. So in this case, it takes the require ID, let's say it's zero, it checks for the cache. If there's no cache, then it continues. It creates the uh, global, the module, puts that already in the cache, and then and it gets the function. So it would get this one, 
and it would execute the function with itself because require one will be called next and uh, the module and module exports and it will return the module exports. So I have a sandbox where this exact bundle has been pasted into the sandbox. You can see it here. You can see if I do require func zero, you can see that it works. It's console logs this AD within a world. I can make it Europe. Um, but this essentially is how this bundler works. And I also created a bundler that does exactly the process that we've just that I just described. It uh, takes some files, in this uh, case a global, and it creates the exact uh, function that I just showed, uh, the exact code. It has this module map and this require function, and it, I do require from zero, but you can see hello, book, 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 world. I can also make this React Europe, and you can see this update here, and you can see the, this update, and here in the actual bundle function, I describe which steps are taken. So for example, I say that step one and two are here, we transform all the files that result to queries, and then this is the concatenation step. I would uh, recommend you to check this if you're interested into how a bundle works, because I think this is the minimal version of a bundle. It's not a lot of content. So now the nitty gritty. I've been talking a lot about recompilation, but I actually never went into recompilation with the bundler because I wanted to explain how a bundler works first. But what about recompilation? Let's say we change this hello world function to hello react Europe. What happens? I'm going to show what I think this should happen. Um, but really, the only thing is that should happen. It transforms this export default hello react Europe into this new function. It does just does all the transforms that we were talking about earlier with the function require, the wrapper, the export default. And it now, um, and if you take the existing module map, it essentially replaces number one in the module map with this one. And this is how bundlers like Metro work, for example. They, um, they regenerate the file and then over a WebSocket connection, they send a new file and they say, replace module one with this code and execute it. Or uh, call all the module.hot uh, callbacks, which is needed for HMR, for hot module reloading. So you don't have to refresh the browser. However, most bundlers uh, don't do this. Uh, they don't do only transformation and only send the file because there is a lot more complicated logic happening with, for example, chunking, uh, tree shaking, code splitting, all those kind of things, which essentially this it comes down to having a very smart, uh, well, having a good cache. But if you have all this logic on top of it, it becomes really hard to cache this. But what if recompilation was, had an O complexity of one? That would mean that if one single file changes, we only transform that file and send it over to the browser. That is what I want to get to because transforming a file can be 50 milliseconds and then you have a near instant compilation time. Then you would get to this process. So I would say that recompilation should actually be, uh, should have an O complexity of one. That's what we should strive for. But why isn't recompilation O1? Well, I just kind of explained it. Uh, I was a bit eager in explaining it, but it is very complicated for bundlers. Uh, it's very complicated to have really smart caching when you also have all the extra logic on top of it. So some recently, some new bundlers have come out, except of Sandpack, that's our bundler, um, which are focused on being purely for development. They do um, generate production bundles, but then not using their own bundler. This is very interesting um, because as you've seen, a bundler can be quite simple. Um, and once, if you, have, if you have a simple bundler, you can really focus on keeping the recompilation time very low. Um, so there are two bundlers that Snowpack and Feet are the ones that I find super interesting and Sandpack is the one that I made. So I will first talk about Snowpack and Feet. These bundlers, they use the concept of ES modules, which is very interesting. Um, because of this, oh, this is something I want to mention as well. I call this all bundlers, but essentially none of these are bundlers. None of these do the concatenation step that we were talking about, and I will get to that. 
Um, but I just have no better word for calling. Uh, we call it all bundlers and well, I don't have a better word for this. So let's talk about feet. Um, I'm not sure how old feet is, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it wasn't older than two weeks. It's a web development bundler um, build tool that focuses on speed. It wants to make the um, development time really fast. And it does this with ES modules. Browsers do understand import statements these days. Uh, and what will happen is if you have, for example, import A from A.js, then the browser will just request this file from the server and it will then uh, uh, give that back. And I can give it as an example here. Oh, if my... Oh, look, I mean, I'm here in two times. I have it somewhere open. Anyway. Um, oh, yeah, I've opened it here. Bye. Um, so I can show how it works here. Index.js requests um, request a.js. Now, if I refresh, you can see that first index.js loads just clean, import a from a.js, and then a.js loads with the uh, export default hello world. There's no transformation, and the browser understands this because you can see here it does a hello world. Now, this is um, really interesting because with this, you don't need to do any concatenation. You don't have to send a full bundle. Um, and this is exactly what Snowpack and Fleet has have been doing. If you have the browser and it requests a.js, then Fleet will uh, resolve the file. And then it will uh, transform this file from the file system and send back the transformed a.js. It won't do any, anything about concatenation or those kind of things. It will just resolve and transform. And because of this, we can use browser caching. So caching is also uh, handled in most, in most part by the browser. Feed still does some kind of caching, but the browser already caches a lot of files. And this is not really useful for, for production bundles because you're really requesting thousands of files at the same time. But for a development, it's completely viable. And um, once feed has resolved a.js, it will watch the file system, it will watch a.js, and whenever it's changed, it will send over a.js, the new version, to the browser as well. And you can see how fast it is uh, just by this tweet. Evan, you was talking about that. Um, normally, he would have like uh, two seconds uh, cold server start, but with feed, it was 129 milliseconds because the browser was able to cache all the uh, transformed files. This is really impressive. And I can say uh, after testing feed that also recompilation is like 50 milliseconds. So that is how ES modules bundler work. I recommend everyone to check out feed. It also works with React. Um, so definitely, uh, or Snowpack. Snowpack also is really interesting. Um, the other bundler that I kind of want to talk about is Sandpack, which is the bundler that we use within Code Sandbox. Because Code Sandbox is, uh, has an interesting case. Whenever you open a Sandbox, we bundle, we install all the NPM dependencies and we bundle the whole project, but we want to make this as fast as possible. It shouldn't work. It shouldn't take long. At most, it should take, everything should take two seconds. So NPM install should be within a second. And then also the um, bundling should be within a second. Quickly checking how much time I have left. Okay. So I want to first tell you how Sandpack actually works because Sandpack also does no concatenation. It actually gets all the files of the project and gets it in the browser, uh, has everything already in the browser, and then it evaluates within the browser itself. So I don't do any kind of concatenation. I just send all the files over and I let Sandpack handle the bundling, although there is no real bundling. So as you can see here, I take this, I do the transforming within Sandpack. I take then the function and I take the require statement and I just execute the function. And there is no bundle or anything that I send to uh, the browser. We just let send back execute all the code. But how is it fast? I want to briefly, very briefly touch on that because, um, but I think I should do another talk about how to talk about how send back is fast specifically. But one thing that we do, if you look at, um, if you look at Excalidra, for example, 
should take this project. And refresh. You can see that I have this beautiful gob mode where I can see how long everything takes. You can see that boot takes around 700 milliseconds, compilation one second of the project, and dependency installing 600 milliseconds, evaluation 200 milliseconds. And that's, uh, that's only possible because we pre-bundle all the dependencies. So you can see for every dependency that uh, uh, Skeletraw has, we do a um, fetch to our pre-bundled CDN uh, with the pre-bundled dependencies and it contains the contents. And we do this for every dependency. Now, this would only be possible if we had control over the file system, which is the case in the case of Sandbox. So we use a technique that's very similar to uh, Yarn uh, version 2, Yarn plug and play. Because we just fetch everything statically from the CDN, there are obviously uh, dependency conflicts, version conflicts, and we resolve them by just taking over the file system. If a dependency requires a specific version of a dependency, we take that FS call and we uh, route it to the right dependency. And only because of that, we can make it really fast. And this is also why Yarn PNP uh, is very fast. So that's the first step that we do. Then the second step is distributed caching. So we have a cache in our bundler that caches all the transformation results, resolving results, um, anything that's computationally expensive, and we put it in a cache. I can maybe show it here, although I don't have much time yet anymore. Uh, sandbox data. And then we have like the timestamp, the uh, resolving of all the files, the cached paths, we have the transpiled modules, which is the transpilation, and we let the user generate this cache. So if I open Excalibur on code sandbox for the first time, I generate, I have to do the full bundle, but then I've generated the cache, which I then send to the code sandbox server. And the next user that opens Excalibur project will share the same cache. So they will be able to see Excalibur open within a second. Mm -hmm. This is interesting because we allow multiple, we don't generate any caches on code sandbox. We allow the user to generate the cache and that cache is then used for the next user. So this is a deep, this is a deep dive in how we can get development bundlers. My um, opinion is that we should really look more into development bundles because they are focused on getting a real fast uh, development experience. And that's currently missing. We don't use it. But the one piece of the puzzle, hot module reloading, that is already uh, fixed by uh, the React team. They have released React Fast Refresh. And initially, we were only able to really change styles without having to refresh the browser. But now we can actually refresh, we can change components and the hooks don't refresh. And I find that super, well, it's super useful. So in our case, for example, here I have a small demo of React Fast Refresh where we change colors and the counter still keeps on counting. And we change the uh, number of the increasement. We can change the text, we can even be crazy in typing. I think that's what I do at the end. Uh, oh, I do, yeah, that, that's what I do here. Um, and that's really powerful. The last thing is that we're missing the instant recompilation. Once we have the instant recompilation, we will have a development experience that we don't want to move away from anymore. We want to have instant recompilation with default. That would be the norm. Um, because once we have that, we can do a lot of new, interesting stuff. And uh, I want to kind of give a sneak peek of what we could do. So one part, uh, one project, for example, let's do, this is, this is code sandbox. Um, this is the sidebar of code sandbox. The cool thing here is that if this is a, this is the demo of, I would be able to suddenly change the styles of this, these files in context. So if I would change, this is, if I would click on here, I would be able to change the color. You can see the results. I can make it yellow. I can make it, uh, brown. And in fact, we're just uh, changing the color here. So if I change he anything here, you can see this color update. And because we have instant recompilation, we see the results immediately. So at the same time, I can, for example, change the, I think it even animates. 
you can change the uh, gap between the files. And you can see that one update here, I think. And because we have instant recompilation, we can just play with the values. Maybe this looks better, or maybe this looks better, or maybe we should go all the way this. I'm not sure if people use a development environment that has this. The second example that I want to show of this is, I was giving initially the example of frame or motion, um, uh, where I was able to change values, but now we have two of these things here. And I can, for example, oh, I can, for example, change the damping. I can make it this. And what happens is this file, this updates. I can make it this. Oh, wow. Wow, now it starts to get beautiful. Maybe I can do this. Look, this, this is much better. Look at um, such, such a beautiful, that's getting crazier. Anyway, um, we, can, we can enable in-context editing. Okay, maybe I should stop this one first. Okay, better. Um, we can enable in-context editing. And okay, I'm getting distracted by this. We can enable in-context editing and it immediately then updates um, all the code and you can immediately see the result. And I think that's the next step after we, uh, we enabled the hot module reloading, which is now done with React Fast Refresh, more and more frameworks are taking it over um, and instant recompilation. That's my talk. I'm really curious what people think. Um, I also want to thank uh, Sid for helping uh, me with preparing this talk. That was super helpful. And uh, yeah, again, I'd love to uh, see what people think. Thanks, Sid. That's very interesting. Ah, oh, flip. <laughs> yeah, we're, um, I think I can speak for most of us when I say we're all very inspired by your curiosity and the ability to take that curiosity and kind of flip it, create solutions or tools that help us all in development, uh, especially in JavaScript and React. Okay. I think it's evident. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think it's evident in the comments and overall in the community. Uh, so I just say thank you for everything you've done, your contributions. Um, I also wanted to mention that the Excaladraw tool that he presented or, or showed was presented yesterday uh, by Christopher Shadow. It's the second to last uh, talk in the stream. Um, we have a question coming in from the Discord chat. So Ives, are you not afraid to miss bugs when using a different bundler for dev and production, especially if one concatenates files and the others don't? Yeah, that is a really good question because that's the um, that is why the development bundlers I think right now are not used. So uh, the next effort that we need to uh, put more, the next thing that we need to try is make the bundler of, for example, the development folks bundler and the production bundler um, share as much logic as possible, um, so that. Uh, it runs the same transforms, it runs the same resolving, and then there is really, there, the discrepancy will be very uh, small by then, but that's something that we don't have right now. I think it would be worth exploring. I think that's uh, the uh, Snowpack approach, right? Snowpack's already doing it right now. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Version two, at least. Yeah, that's true. Great, we also had a question about one of the terms you used. Um, what exactly do you mean by in-context editing? <laughs> yeah, um, in-context editing is the thing that, um, so if you can, for example, if you have an element and um, you want to change the padding, it would be very nice if you don't have to open a text file and uh, change the padding in there. It would be better if you would be, uh, if you could see the element itself and then on the element, you can change the padding maybe by sliding. So you are in context of the, um, the element that you're editing. And I think that there is a lot of exploration on this happening right now. Um, and that is something that I think we should explore more. Um, so that's what I call in-context editing. But I, I, this is the first time I rewatched a talk of myself and I even had to be completely <laughs> quiet the whole time. Um, and I, I see that I am, uh, I forget the terms. For example, I call feed and snowpack a bundler while Actually, they are not really bundling. That is their selling point. Uh, same for Sandpack. Uh, so the terms that I'm using can sometimes can uh, cause a bit of confusion. 
we, we do need we do, we do need a new name for these kinds of tools um, because yeah we don't know like even bundler less is kind of um, <laughs> exactly true as well and so some people are using that on twitter and uh, like people don't like that um i i, I can offer so you know i i um i think a lot of people are inspired by brett victor uh and his uh and his talks uh, i think i think it's called future programming um and uh, I can offer direct manipulation, like as because like you're you're literally changing the values and then seeing that update live, and then the code also basically code mods itself. Or, I, I don't know. No, I don't think that's that's the right term of of of, of what you're doing. But um, you know, direct man manipulation in 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 sense of like you're changing the values and, and dragging around, and you can see that uh, directly affect your code. Yeah, exactly. Direct manipulation. That's that's the much better term in context. <laughs> I agree. I don't know. <laughs> it's your it's your feature. You can do, you can name it whatever you want. <laughs> we have another question from the uh, Discord chat. Uh, aren't you afraid of this two way binding? Seems like in context is just that. Yep. Yeah. Uh, that's absolutely true. I think that's the biggest challenge. Um, lots of people are tackling this right now. That, uh, for example, how do you make it possible to um, edit any type of code from within the UI? The UI really you would need to understand the code. The thing that I'm uh, leaning towards right now is having a solution for a specific type of library so that you, that you follow the, uh, the library itself. So this is what uh, CodeSamux has done on a different field. Um, with Sandpack, we really focused initially on making it um, similar to create React app in terms of API. Um, in terms of two-way binding, um, if you change the code from within the preview or if you change the preview from within the code, I'm not a, I'm not afraid of uh, any conflicts there. I think that's uh, especially since you have to in the end um, commit your changes by pressing save, so you can also always still undo. Um, but the biggest challenge I think is in understanding the code and making the change the code in such a way that the developer will still be happy, because we all know how opinionated we are on tabs versus spaces. For yes. Example. Everyone's very opinionated. <laughs> um, here's an opinionated question. Why do you not use ES6 modules and still transform to common JS in Sandpack? Oh, that's a, that's a question. That's a really good question. And that's something that I've been thinking a lot about, especially since uh, ES modules uh, are getting more and more adoption. The reason that um, I haven't done it until now is because not all dependencies uh, would work. Um, so some dependencies are still common JS only. Um, and then in that case, it wouldn't work. And right now we want to have compatibility with, uh, for example, create React app or view CLI and want to make it work similarly. However, um, there are now tools that can transform common JS modules to ES modules. It's not 100% perfect because you have the side effects still, but it's something to, um, it's something to reconsider. I'd like to reconsider to using uh, ES modules, um, especially since um, Feed, for example, has shown that with the ES modules, you still have control over uh, how files are executed. So for example, Feed has support for pop module reloading, and that is uh, completely new for um, ES modules uh, in the space of, the, of executing code. So, yeah, actually this talk, also working on this talk has really inclined me to start thinking more about how we could move sent back to run uh, ES modules because we can, the distributed cache that I was talking about earlier, we can make everyone who uses code sandbox share the same cache of uh, transpilation results. And that would be super interesting if you don't have to transpile a file that someone else has transpiled before as well. Great. Do we have any other questions from the panel here? Oh, uh, what about your slides? Do you can you drop us a link to those slides and we can share them with the attendees? Yeah, yeah. I've uh, uh, I've I used um, Keynote on this one. I'm not sure how I can share them, but I will try. I just wanted to That's use fine. this magic move thing. It's uh, absolutely. I like it too. If if you could uh, drop it to Patrick and we can share it. Uh, but we definitely understand. Um, all right. So I'll hand it over to John. If we don't have any more questions. Oh wait, hold on. Uh, can't Snowpack transform the modules on server to ES6 to wrap old CG, CJS modules? Uh, yeah. 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 Exactly. So that's something that's uh, that's now uh, 
popping up more. I saw that uh, bundlers make common JS work by uh, wrapping them in ES modules or converting them to ES modules. So that's really interesting. By the way, very meta um, editing code sandbox and code sandbox. <laughs> cool. That was such a All right. <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very much for joining us, guys. Yeah, thank you. All right. Yeah. Thanks. Good job. All right.